So the last algorithm I want to cover is Grover's algorithm. Now Grover's algorithm is interesting because it's pretty universally applicable. So you're asking just for having a function that encapsulates a search problem. So it's in his paper it was described as a search on unstructured data. I think this is a bit misleading because you need to be able to capture this in an efficiently computable function. This app which appears there, you will have to compute a lot of times in this algorithm, but many of our crypto problems can be captured in this. So we're going to look at the simplest function, the simplest case, where we have a function in n bits, which maps to just 0 or 1. You can have this with larger output spaces. I will just look at the 1-bit output. And then we have built this function f so that we're interested in a unique s input so that we're getting zero as output. And we're promised that there's only one such s. Everything else gives you one, and that's one value which gives you zero. Okay, yeah, now I can start thinking like how can you turn your favorite crypto problem in something which fits this. For instance, if you have a plain text ciphertext pair for key as and you want to search for the key, then you can take well, the function of the computation of AS with the n bit key as the n bit input variables, and then to get zero as the output, well, you're computing it on it, and then you're subtracting the ciphertext, so then the right key will give you zero. That will have more output bits, so this can be a function from n input bits to m output bits, but important as a comparison to Simon's algorithm, this need not be a function where anything happens is F2. It can take things mod 2, but it's just some circle that you're building. If you traditionally would be looking for this S, then we don't have any other mechanisms and well, assume that there's no weakness in this F, then we don't have any other mechanism than taking a lot of values, um, just random input values, U of n bits, computing F of U, and hoping to find this one elusive S. Typically won't happen, so we keep on searching, keep on searching, and we pretty much have no chance of finding it until we have done a lot of work. But a lot of work means we've basically searched through all the search space. There are two to the n elements that I can represent as, well, n bits, and so I need about that many searches. What Grover does is it speeds that up to 2 to the n over 2 computations of f. However, these are now computations on a quantum computer, so in particular these have to be reversible. Um, so it's more expensive to do these computations. For instance, if we go back to this AS example, computing AS with a normal circuit needs fewer gates than a reversible computation of AS. And there are lots of these computations, so there's of course a constant overhead for it. But it's typically smaller than the benefit of an extra factor of 2 to the n over 2. So typically Grover is faster than taking just random searches. But as soon as if you have anything structured, like if you have already a public key algorithm, you have typically faster than you brute force searches uh, the algorithm, then Grover won't help you much. If there is some brute force component, then it will speed that part up, but it might not be the fastest. Well, let's see what Grover is doing. So we're starting from a uniform superposition on all the n bits. We have seen that in the, the video on Simon's algorithm. So there we've been doing um, this first row was the one is the zero position and then all zeros. And then by doing Hadamard zero, Hadamard one, Hadamard two, we've been spreading this out into a uniform superposition. Now there we've been doing the row indices, uh, sorry, the column indices as the first part and the row indices as the f of u. In this case, we're just having our f of u being one bit, so there would be just two rows on top of each other. But we can think of the same computations here as well. And now the two steps in Grover's algorithm are starting the same way. In step one, we're computing this function, so we have done the uniform zero position. We now have, we can now compute the value so that it moves the one around. And then ah, it almost always moves into the bottom row. There's only one place where it's in the top row, namely where the value is zero. And then there we negate the amplitude. So the single plus one in the top row turns into a minus one, and all those plus ones 
say plus ones. So this negation step is very fast, and the step of computing this f, all that takes however many steps computing f takes. Also, we now need to uncompute it. So we're just interested in what the amplitude is, but we're moving it back to this qubit. So this is one of the steps where we're computing f of u, actually compute and uncompute. But we have changed the amplitude. And then, well, we have negated one of the amplitudes, still one. So not having any change there yet. However, step two, and that's what we have seen in the quantum computing for method for computers for cryptographers part two, is the negation around the average. And that is actually changing how likely you're going to measure something. It's a fast operation. It's just a sequence of a few Hadamars and some mystery gates that you're going to figure out, and then some Hadamars. And then what Grover is doing is just a whole lot of these step one, step two, step one, step two. And then at some point he stops. And the stopping point is roughly at the square root of the search space. So square root of the search space means a zero, a two to the 0 0.5 times n. And then there's a scaling factor of 0 0.58. So then you stop and you measure. And then this one elusive s where f of s is zero that should be the output. So we're going to measure this one and hopefully find s. And else we start over. Since we know what the function is when we have a quantum circuit for it, we can also now test whether this was the correct s. And if so, we're happy and else we try again. So there is a probability of measuring the wrong value, at least the typical way we're stopping. And so we might have to repeat this. And you can have some trade-offs about like when to stop and measure versus how often you have to repeat it. So let's graph this a little bit. So what we're seeing here is, well, all the numbers between zero and two to the 12 minus one. And so um, I'm normalizing the probabilities this time. So this is now really the amplitude, the way that we would normally expect to see this in quantum algorithms. So it's between zero and one. However, there's a, well, there's a sign as well. And then you see there's a horizontal line at zero. And you see just above that there's a line as well. So this is after step one, we have computed the function and we have a zero in just one of those. Okay, now we can, we can see it. I know it's not that secret. It's just two to the 12 values. You could do this, of course. However, let's assume this is much, much larger. So then you have a line which is marginally above zero and then somewhere there's a pin down which you can't really see. So after step, one, this one has a negative amplitude. So it's not plus one, but it's minus one. And then, okay, it's normalized again. And then what step two is doing is saying, okay, we're averaging, uh, we we're negating around the average. So the average is just slightly below this line. So the normal numbers are just going to be moving a notch below this line. Now this one pin there, that is notice you're below the line, so it's going to go all the way up to the average and then flip up to twice the time. Okay, so let's see this happen. So after step one and step two, well, the pin is now up and it's gotten longer than it was before. And now we're going to do another step one. So we're going to take everything stays the same sign, except we're going to negate the one where it's zero. Okay, so we get the pin pointing down, same length. And then we can do a step two, which is negating the above, uh, around the average. And that means the pin grows up a bit. I will now skip this step one, step two, step one, step two, and just do pairs of step one and step two. So I've now done two pairs of this. And after three pairs, four pairs, you see it growing slowly. And so if you now measure, you're already more likely to measure the number that we're interested in, namely this index here. But we can amplify this. Each time that we do another pair, step one, step two, is going to increase this because we're, the average is going down a little bit and this pin is going to be, well, not quite doubling in size, but close enough. Okay, so five steps, six steps. So something around 30, we might say, okay, well, this is high enough where we already, yeah, so let's say 35 steps. This is high enough that we could already measure and be getting most of it. This is fairly likely or overwhelmingly likely to 
give us the right value. It's not yet 1 and 0 everywhere else, but it's a pretty okay moment to stop. And pushing it all the way up will take extra steps, which might not be necessary. Okay, but traditionally we're going to continue measuring it and walking for a bit longer, so at 50 that's the traditional moment to stop. So when we really reach very close to the 1 and everything else is at 0, essentially. Okay, so then we measure and we get this index. This does require that we know something about this distribution. This does require that we know the size of the space. Okay, it's 2 to the n. Um, and that we are also really sure that there's only one value. If there suddenly are two values where this is 0, then this whole distribution gets messed up. And for instance, if we're overshooting, if we just continue walking after this, then, well, we're now negating around the average. And that now means we're actually getting shorter. So this would be basically step back to square one where we started. So this would be a very, very bad stopping point. So this is about twice as long as we would normally walk. But well, just to be sure, you need to know something before you can apply uh, Grover. It, it's not the case that walking longer will get you better results. All right, that's it on Grover. Thanks.